But I think Simon Sinek's why is aged just very slightly. And I'll tell you why is that when organizations are asked what their why is, right. what they often do is regurgitate where they are right now. Yes. And most organizations don't know what they're supposed to be in the future. And so when you don't understand what you're supposed to be, your why stays static. Hey! Let's go! Back! If you could give all your riches just to say the word, would you risk it? These politicians so old can't tell live the day where they live it. Said I'm at my prime. I think the one guy that's really changed the way I approach how I position my business is Simon Sinek, who I know you know very well, um, with his why you do it and not what you do. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I think he's been quite instrumental in a lot of businesses in, in the way he's changed their perspe perception around how to, what language you use and what, and I know language is very important to you, and also around how they, yeah, position themselves. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the why was all about the purpose, right? Yes. And uh, I think it's incredibly important still because I think more and more through like sort of hyper transparency, consumers are wanting to uh, attach their values to somebody else. You mm. know what I mean? And so like a Patagonia does this so well. I mean, their value systems are so clearly defined and they're not shy about it. Mm. You know, you create such clear super fans uh, when you have these very strong values. But I think Simon Sinek's why is aged just very slightly. And I'll tell you why is that when organizations are asked what their why is, right. what they often do is regurgitate where they are right now. Yes. And most organizations don't know what they're supposed to be in the future. And so when you don't understand what you're supposed to be, your why stays static. Right. I think there must be a new circle. I think, uh, like Simon Sinek's got the why, the how, and the what, right? I think there must be another circle in the middle that's who. It's like, who are you going to be in the future? Mm. And then why do you exist? Mm, I like that. And so you really like organizations that want to stay banks in the future, which are banks and want to stay banks, that's not truly who they should be in the future. They need to be diversifying and creating disruptive sideline businesses where they're going to disrupt themselves or jump in categories changes their who, which means their why must be shifting as well. So organizations don't have the know-how of understanding how to contextualize and categorize trends in a very specific way that gives them an understanding of who they need to be. And so I worked at De Beers and De Beers famously is known for diamonds. But if you look at the trends around what's going on with asset consumption, 20 to 30% of the human population are in mature awareness cities. Right. And these cities are underpinned by something called guilt-free consumption. And guilt-free consumption moves people away from buying houses, cars, watches, definitely diamonds, and so the who De Beers is going to be in the future is not a diamond business, but a luxury business. Yeah. Because if I'm a luxury business, then I'm able to change what I do for that market, that market, and that market. So De Beers has got a shrinking market with a mature awareness market who are very wealthy, but just choose not to spend their money on diamonds or assets. What they are choosing to spend their money on is experiences. Mm. So now De Beers can change their who to becoming a luxury business and that impacts their why mm. and so i think that we need to start looking at who we're going to be why do we exist how do we bring it across and then what is it that we actually do how often do you think businesses should address their who yeah, I think it's a great question. You know, I think certain industries are just moving much quicker than other industries. I think you need to have a constant eye on what's happening so that it's a fluid process. I don't yeah. think it's a strategy session once a year. Yeah. I think it's the inclusion of a, the fastest growing board member in America right now is the chief future officer. Yeah. And so if you have that constant conversation with the chief future officer, it's a constant agility process. It's a constant switching and moving, switching and moving so that it's an ongoing process of being agile. You know, I yeah. speak about it in my keynotes is the celebration of IQ and EQ must be falling away to AQ, you know, yeah. agility quotient, flexibility quotient, our ability to try new things, experiment on an ongoing basis, keeps us future focused rather than being uh, stuck in what we were successful before and then mm. just keep repeating that and becoming mm. more efficient about it. Mm. And I think the other, the other officer which is also growing hugely is the chief experience officer. Yes. And I think, you know, you talk a lot about hyper-personalization, hyper-convenience, mm. and that all ties into creating a an, an memorable and unique experience. Yes. And when you merge those two, 
I think that role is only going to become even more important along with the you know, chief marketing, chief future, chief executive. Chief so I, I think what's happening with that chief experience officer, what they're doing is prioritizing the consumer. Yeah. And you know, what the problem is, is with that is that if you prioritize your balance sheet over the consumer, you then make decisions based on your balance sheet, not the consumer. Yeah. And so you can't trick yourself. You yeah. can't say I'm consumer centric and then first part of the board meeting spend talking about your profits and not your consumer. Yeah. And if you look at Jeff Bezos, again, he's all about yeah. consumer obsession. And then wait for capital, have patient capital so that you can move and weave until the consumer is really inside your sort of web of necessity. I mean, order in here in South Africa, my friend Dinesh, I was with him last night. And he's doing hundreds of millions of rands turnover. And guess what? He's not making a profit yet. And that's very clearly part of his strategy. And so the investors that he's brought on board, which are some massive investors yeah. around the world, very well understand this. Yeah. It's like, let's integrate ourselves into the community to the point where you can't let go yeah. and then switch on profit. Customer adoption. Con customer adoption. And that's Jeff Bezos again. Yeah. Consumer adoption is the only innovation that really matters. I think, if I'm not mistaken, Amazon's why is to be, or who, if you want to kind of get it, that yeah. is to be the most customer-centric business in the world. Yes. Well, their why is... Um, very linked to who they are already in the future because what they did was started off bookshops, then everything, then web services, becoming a bank. I mean, they're just jumping categories and sectors. Yeah. It shows you they're consumer focused. Yeah. We want to be anything the consumer needs yeah. us to be not based on our capability, mm. not based on our competition, but based really on what they want. Mm. I mean, how do you jump from books to everything, mm. to web services, to yeah. a bank? Yeah. It's like it's almost like we own every aspect of that consumer sort of focus, and, and that's they've why nailed it. They nailed they've it. nailed it. They're way ahead of anybody else because what they've done is approached the future in an innovative way. It's not about a product or a service; it's about institutionally shifting the way you think. And Jeff Bezos just had that inherently inside him. I mean, if you listen to any of his podcasts or read any of his books, he's highly intelligent. I mean, from a very young age, he was top of his class, really focused on what he's doing. So yeah. it's by no mistake that he's kind of created this incredible organization. And I even think incredible sector of way of doing business. You know, yeah. It's much bigger than that.